Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you are enjoying this podcast, you can subscribe using your favorite podcast software, whether it's Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or the Amazon Music app at amazon.com slash otrdetectives. Also, I do encourage you to pick up your Famous Investigator t-shirt. Be sure and order before November 29th to make sure that you receive it by Christmas. Go over to famous.greatdetectives.net. Now it is time for this week's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The original air date, June the 1st, 1954, and the title is The Temperamental Tote Board Matter. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Ben Gordon, Johnny. Got a strange one for you. Well, who's the deceased and where did it happen? Well, his name's Luis Alvarado, a $50,000 life policy. He's a bachelor, his brother Jose is the beneficiary, and the two of them own a racetrack in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Well, uh, outside of the fact that not too many people own racetracks, what's so strange about it? Well, an exercise boy found him under the tote board in the infield at 6 this morning. He had a thirty-eight caliber bullet hole in his chest and a winning ticket and a long shot in his hand. Well, Johnny? Well, I guess there's nothing stranger than a winning ticket on a long shot at that. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund and another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum somehow makes time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working, driving, shopping, or just taking things easy, that good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat, chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Washingtonian Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the temperamental tote board matter. Expense account item one, $147.35. Airfare between Hartford and San Juan, Puerto Rico. I checked in at the Carib Hilton and then made my way to police headquarters where I introduced myself to Ulpiano Cardenas, captain of police. It is perhaps unfortunate you did not check with us by telephone before coming down, Senor Dollar. You might have saved yourself the trip. Oh, why is that, Captain? It is our belief that the insurance of Senor Luis Alvarado has no bearing whatsoever upon his murder. Well, what does have a bearing on it? Perhaps you have heard of Anthony Randolph. Randolph? Is that the same Tony Randolph who's connected with a Miami gambling syndicate? It is. He is here now in San Juan. And for several weeks, he has been attempting to persuade the Alvarado brothers to sell him an interest in the track. How is he making out? Two days ago, Senor Luis Alvarado almost physically threw him out of his office. And now Luis is dead? Yes. Well, have you got anything besides uh, possible motive? Senor Alvarado was last seen by his employees working in his office when the track closed at 6 o'clock last night. His death was caused by a thirty-eight caliber bullet 
and the time of death was approximately 4 o'clock this morning. Where was Tony Randolph at that time? According to himself and three of his personal friends, he was asleep in his room at the Condado Beach Hotel. That's best a questionable alibi. Yeah. I understand Alvarado's body was found under the tote board in the infield. Is uh, that where he was killed? We have no conclusive evidence either way. And what about that winning ticket on a long shot he had in his hand? It was a $10 ticket on Bella Maria, the winner of the fourth race yesterday. The price was $72 to win. Ah, not bad. Any idea what he was doing with the ticket? No, but it would hardly seem to have any bearing on the murder. Uh Uh-huh. Of course, it is possible our suspicions are wrong concerning this Anthony Randolph. However, I still do not believe you will find the insurance to be the motive. You seem pretty sure of that, Captain. Why? Luis and Jose Alvarado were always very close, not only as partners in the racetrack and other business ventures, but personally as well. After all, they were brothers. Yeah, so were Cain and Abel. Expense account item two, $2.75. Cab fare out to the Descanso racetrack. I got there between the fifth and sixth races... Made my way to the west wing of the clubhouse, where the Alvarado brothers had their private offices. Buenas tardes, senor. Oh, hello. Is uh, senor Alvarado in? Oh, I regret, senor, but he's not. I am Maria Roldan, his confidential secretary. Would there be anything I could do for you? Uh, When will he be back, uh, Miss uh, Roldan? Not for several hours, senor Donner. Sounds like you were expecting me. But of course. Jose had word that you were arriving. Oh, how terribly unfortunate that his absence makes it necessary for me to work here this afternoon. Oh, why is that? Well, part of my duties consists of acting as hostess when we have special guests. Jose seems to think I make a rather pleasant impression upon them. Yeah, I can see why. Too bad we'll have to postpone it. Perhaps not any longer than 8 o'clock this evening at Avenida Piedras. Number 49. That's an easy number to remember. Expense account item three, $1.85. Cab fare to the Condado Beach Hotel. I found Tony Randolph on a private patio overlooking the beach. He came completely equipped with swim trunks, dark glasses, and three close-mouthed bodyguards hovering obtrusively in the background. Sure, be glad to tell you what I can, Mr. Dollar, but uh, I don't figure why you came to see me. Well, you were trying to buy an interest in the Descanso racetrack from the Alvarados. Yeah, that's right. I came down here on a little vacation, saw the plant. It looked pretty good, so I figured I might invest a few bucks in it. How are you making out? Well, you know how these things are. It takes a little time. The boys have been playing hard to get, trying to raise the price, but uh, we're getting on Okay. I hear you had a little fuss with Luis Alvarado at the office the other day. What fuss? We were just clowning around, that's all. Just clowning around. Uh Uh-huh. I don't suppose you'd have any idea who killed him. Me? How could I know anything like that? I just met the guy when I came down here. All I know is he seemed a nice guy, had a nice plant here, and I wanted to go in with him. How would I have any idea who'd want to kill him? Just thought I'd ask. That's okay, Mr. Dollar. You got a 50 grand insurance investment. Before you pay off, you want to make sure everything's on the up and up. Don't blame you one bit. And I'll tell you you what I'll do for you. Yeah? What's that? I got a few connections down here. Some uh, friends owe me a couple of favors, you know? Yeah, I know. Oh, sometimes they get to talking about things like that. Shooting the breeze, nothing better to do. If I hear anything, I'll let you know. I'll let me. That'll be just great. Expense account item four, one dollar and eighty-five cents. Cab fare back to the Descanso racetrack. After that rather fruitless interview with Tony Randolph, I was hoping that Jose Alvarado would be back and I might have better luck with him. But as I approached Alvarado's office, Captain Cardenas came hurrying out. Oh, Senor Dollar, you are just in time. Yeah, for what? My office just called. There has been a shooting at the home of Jose Alvarado. And the report was phoned in to my office by his son, Tomas. What did he have to say? He was rather agitated and did not talk long enough to give details. 
He merely reported that there had been a shooting and requested that an ambulance be sent to the house immediately. Tomas Alvarado was waiting at the house to greet us. And so was a corpse stretched out on the living room floor. A 38 caliber revolver laying beside an outstretched hand. Tomas did the honors. His name is Julio Mendoza, a former employee of ours at the track. Why he should have done such an insane thing, I do not know. Well, just what did he do, Mr. Alvarado? I do not know what started it. I was in the library going over the list of pallbearers for my uncle's funeral. Then I heard the angry voices arguing in here. Your father's voice and Mendoza's? See, si. There was a sound like a blow and I heard my father cry out. I took a gun from the desk and came in here. That forty-five cold automatic on the table over there? Ah, see, si. As I came running in, Mendoza fired a shot at me and I fired one in return and he fell. Then I ran over to my father. He was alive, Senor Alvarado. Si, but uh, unconscious. He has a bad heart. Whether it was a blow or the excitement of the argument, I do not know. I put in the call for an ambulance and it took my father to the hospital. And then you arrived. You said Mendoza was a former employee. That is correct. He was a paramutual machine operator. He was discharged yesterday by my uncle Luis for stealing. Now, obviously, there is some connection between that, the scene with my father, and possibly my uncle's death. Fortunately, there is no need to speculate. When your father regains consciousness, he can tell us. Might not hurt to speculate about one thing, Captain. What is that, Senor Dollar? A bit of pasteboard under Mendoza's arm. Looks like a paramutual ticket to me. It is, Senor. A ten-dollar win ticket in the fourth race yesterday, Number 214, Bella Maria. When the homicide men arrived, Tomas Alvarado dictated a statement to them and then left for the hospital. Captain Cardenas went to headquarters. I went back to the Hilton. Expense account item five, $6.75. Drinks and sandwiches on the hotel veranda while waiting for 8 o'clock and my rendezvous with Maria Roldan. My peaceful contemplation of the view was interrupted by two phone calls. The first was from Captain Cardenas. We have just received a report from Ballistics, Senor Dollar. Julio Mendoza's gun is the same one which killed Senor Luis Alvarado. Obviously, our case is closed. The second call was from Tony Randolph. That took a little longer. Say, Dollar, I hear you got a guy named Mendoza pitching hold for the Alvarado murder. Where did you hear that, Randolph? I told you I had connections, didn't I? Yeah, so you did. Well, the word around town is you got the wrong cookie. Very interesting. What else does the word have to say? Nothing much. Only that somebody has figured out a way of beating the races. Maybe if you find out who it is and how it's done, you'll have your man. You have any suggestions? Yeah, one. Ask Jose Alvarado. Friends, no matter what kind of work you do, there are bound to be times when the job seems monotonous. You feel tense and restless, and you need something to give you a boost. Well, you'll be surprised how helpful a stick of Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum can be at times like that. You see, chewing on a smooth piece of Wrigley Spearmint gum is a natural way to ease tension and relieve that feeling of restlessness. The easy chewing gives you satisfaction. You get a nice little lift out of it. And Wrigley Spearmint gum tastes good, too. Its flavor is lively, refreshing spearmint, a flavor millions enjoy. Try it and see for yourself. Get a few packages of Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum and chew a stick from time to time while you work. Chewing this delicious gum will make your job seem easier and pleasanter. It really will. And now with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. A 
Expense account item six, one dollar and seventy-five cents. Cab fare to Avenida Piedras number forty-nine, a swank ultra-modern apartment building in the newer Santurce section. It smelled money, and so did the lush evening gown Maria was wearing as she greeted me. How nice of you to be so prompt, Johnny. You are even a bit early. Well, I was hoping you wouldn't mind. Oh, how could I mind? As you see, I'm already dressed. And when a woman is dressed and ready when her escort arrives, it usually indicates he is rather important to her. Yeah. What I'm trying to figure out is uh, why. Oh, <laughs> you know, the Americanos. You're always looking for reasons, for motivation. Is it not enough that a woman finds you attractive and wishes to spend some time in your company? Well, I suppose it could be. But it is not. In this case, no. I was afraid this evening would not turn out as pleasantly as I'd hoped. I'm sorry. Yeah, there's no need to be. After all, we're down here on business. I can understand. I will answer your questions as best I can. Thanks. Well, suppose we start with Alvarado's murder and those Bella Maria wind tickets. Johnny, are you familiar with the operation of a pari mutual track? As familiar as I want to be. Well, then you know it operates like a complicated adding machine. As each ticket is punched out and sold, the totals appear on the illuminated board in the infield. At the end of each race, the amount of money that has been bet is paid out on the winning horses. It is a foolproof system, entirely automatic. Neither more nor less money than has been bet can be paid out. Well, you've spelled it out pretty clearly. Now, uh, why? Johnny, $21,000 was bet on the fourth race yesterday. As of 6 o'clock this afternoon, more than 26000 had been paid out on winning tickets. Over 5000 more than had been bet. See. You sure about that? I saw the head bookkeeper's figures on it at closing time. Was the overage all paid out on $10 win tickets on Bay of Maria? See, it was. Has this ever happened before? Well, I do not know. Only Jose and Luis ever see the figures. It is only because I was there alone today that I happened to see them. Uh-huh. What does Tomas Alvarado do at the track? Well, he has charge of the garden protection service. And uh, Julio Mendoza? He operated a very mutual machine. At a $10 window? See? Si. Very interesting. So interesting that it will interfere with our plans for this evening? There'll be other nights, Maria. <laughs> Expense account item seven, $2.40. Cab fare to police headquarters. Captain Cardenas didn't seem to be too impressed with my latest information. No, Senor Dollar, I do not believe it is possible. I can think of no way in which the Paddy Mutuel system can be fixed. Well, the extra 5000 paid out on Bea Maria must mean something. We have only the word of Senorita Roldan that such a sum was paid out. Well, the bookkeeper could verify it. I will check on it, of course, Senor Dollar. But this much I can tell you now. It is mechanically impossible to fix the tote board or to punch out any tickets after the race begins. What about forgery? Well, that too would be virtually impossible. Each ticket has an especial picture code printed upon it, and the codes are changed with every race. Ah, sounds pretty foolproof, doesn't it? Believe me, it is, Senor Dollar. And even if it were not, what possible connection could all this have with the murder of Luis Alvarado? I wish you hadn't asked that, Captain. It's been bothering me, too. I borrowed a headquarters car from Cardenas to take the burden off the cab fare items on this expense account and drove out to the Condado Beach Hotel. Tony Randolph was in the gambling casino. His mood wasn't quite as expansive as it had been earlier that day. Okay, Dollar, what's on your mind now? And make it snappy, will you? I've got things to do. You sound like the dice have been biting the hand that rolls them. Sir, they're cold. Come on, let's get on with it. Sure. Just tell me who you're gunning for, and you can go back to the tables. You better clean up that crack, Dollar, and give it to me straight. You're no philanthropist, Randolph. You didn't pass along the word this afternoon out of the kindness of your heart. What's it to you why I passed it? If it's straight, it'd get you off the hook, do it? Even if it's not, it could get you off one, too. That's supposed to mean something? Yeah. If Jose Alvarado is sent up for the murder of his brother, you might have an easier job getting hold of that racetrack stuff. And you'd save that 50 grand in insurance. So where's your beef, darling? No beef, if it works out that way. Why don't you make sure it does? Well, maybe I need a little professional advice. Let's take a walk outside. Yeah, sure. Okay, Dollar, lay it out. 
Well, it could be like this. Somebody figures a way to beat the mutuals. Luis Alvarado tumbles to it, so he's kept quiet with a thirty-eight caliber slug. That could make sense. Only they tell me the mutuals can't be beat. They could be wrong. How wrong? There's no law against cashing winning tickets a day or two after the race. Well, you'd have to get the tickets first. Or print them yourself. What's it take to do that? You have to get into the track when it's closed. Get hold of the codes and a roll of ticket paper. And know how to operate one of the machines without flashing the tote board. Takes a lot of doing. Not if you're head man at the track at all. Yeah. Anything else on your mind, darling? No. Uh, no, I don't think so. I do not know, Senor Dollar. It is still a theory without proof. Well, the bookkeeper should be able to supply us with some. No, I am afraid not. Oh? Why? He was called away from the track after the seventh race. Some family business. He died in a traffic accident on the way. You're sure it was an accident? Oh, there is no question. Uh-huh. An unfortunate occurrence for us. Yeah, even tougher for him. Yes. Of course, we can always check the records at the track, and in that way we... Your pardon. Sure, go ahead. Captain Cardenas. See? Gracias. I think perhaps you will find this of interest, Senor Dollar. What is it? The gun found beside Mendoza's body. It is registered to Senor Jose Alvarado. Before leaving the office with Captain Cardenas, I found time for one short telephone call. I think I'll be able to drop around in about an hour, Maria. I will be waiting, Johnny. The hospital told us that Jose Alvarado's condition was still too critical to allow questioning. So the captain and I went out to the Descanso racetrack instead. The full moon was taking a siesta behind a bank of clouds, and the dim, shadowy bulk of the grandstand looked deserted. The watchman at the gate assured us that no one had entered the track since closing time. I think perhaps we are being rather foolish, Senor Dollar. There is nothing to be learned out here at this hour of the night. What about the bookkeeper's report? It could wait until the morning. Maybe it wouldn't be there by then. That is a possibility, of course. However, the hospital assures me that Senor Alvarado could not be released for some time. Well, I won't do any harm to look. Wait, senor. In there, behind that ticket cage, a light. Yeah. What would anyone be doing in there? Operating one of the paramutual machines. By hand. There is an entrance to the cages at this side. Over here. Can you see who it is? No. Who are you? The police! Stand still! All right. All right. So, it was Tomas Alvarado. Call for an ambulance. I'm hurt. An ambulance. I don't want to die out here. I don't think your Uncle Louis wanted to either. On the way to the hospital, Tomas Alvarado gave us a confession to the murders of Luis Alvarado and Julio Mendoza. Both were motivated by their separate discoveries of Tomas's little plan for getting rich off his father's racetrack. When the surgeon finally convinced him he wasn't going to die, he decided to retract and left a few details unanswered. 
But he had told us enough to satisfy Captain Card- Cardenas. So it was as I told you in the beginning, Senor Dollar. The insurance had nothing to do with this matter. Yeah, but you've got to admit Jose Alvarado was involved. Apparently only to the extent of a blackmail attempt by Julio Mendoza. However, that need be no concern of yours. The unfinished business we will take care of in due time. Say, that reminds me. I've got a little unfinished business of my own. Maria was waiting for me as agreed. She looked even more lush and lovely than she had earlier. She recommended a nightclub. And on our way downtown, I gave her a short resume of what had happened. So it was Tomas who was responsible. Oh, what a pity, Johnny. Why is that? He could have had everything he wanted if he'd only been willing to wait for it. His father's money, you mean? See, it would have come to him in time. But to do this, to deliberately rob and murder because he wanted the money now... Why do people do such things, Johnny? Well, who knows? Maybe somebody talks them into it. Maybe it's for some woman. Maybe both together. See? I suppose that is true. Oh, but then why should we concern ourselves about that now? This is our night, Johnny. There must be nothing more to spoil it. Yeah, I think that was probably it. What? The combination. Some woman talking him into it. He had to be working with somebody. He couldn't have cashed all those extra tickets himself. Be a dead giveaway. So somebody else helped him to spread them around. Oh, Johnny, you're talking about business again. What did you do with the tickets, Maria? Uh, Sell them at a discount to some fence? You're not being very funny, Johnny. If this is your idea of a pleasant It's no good, Maria. You tipped it when you said you saw the bookkeeper's figures at the end of the racing day. Too bad you didn't know he'd left the track at the end of the seventh race. It was a good try at keeping your own skirts clean, but it didn't work out. Johnny, this is police headquarters. Yeah. Let's go in, shall we? Expense account item eight, thirty-eight dollars and fifteen cents. Hotel bill and miscellaneous. Expense account item nine, one hundred fifty-two dollars and ten cents. Airfare back to Hartford. Expense account total, three hundred fifty-four dollars and ninety-five cents. Remarks: Jose Alvarado was still too ill the next day to have any visitors, so I left Puerto Rico without seeing him. Perhaps it's just as well. How can you give a man fifty thousand dollars with one hand and? Take away his son with the other. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, next time you chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum... Notice how cool and fresh it makes your mouth feel. That's because Wrigley's Spearmint Gum has lots of lively, refreshing, real spearmint flavor in every stick. The minute you sink your teeth in, that cooling flavor begins to freshen your taste and relieve that hot, dry feeling in your throat. It sweetens the breath, too. Millions of people carry Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum with them wherever they go for quick, long-lasting refreshment and for real chewing enjoyment. Next time you're at the store, get some Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Enjoy its refreshing flavor and good, pleasant chewing often, every day. Remember, that's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Sidney Marshall with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Hal March, Edgar Barrier, Lillian Bayef, Ted DeCorsia, and Don Diamond. 
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. John Harrington comes your way. Welcome back. Between last week's show and this week's, I'm convinced that Jaime Del Valle had unleashed his episode naming madness from the lineup. A temperamental tote board. That is such a lineup episode title. And there are a couple others that also have that same vibe. You just know uh, reading it. Yeah, Hami Novi came up with this title. It was interesting to have someone concerned with whether the insurance company actually be investigating the case. You know, I think Johnny was right, even though Captain Cardenas was right about the brother not being involved. They couldn't just take the local police's word on that. Well, listener comments and feedback now. And we start with an email from Kevin revisiting the whole issue of the organ music in uh, Johnny Dollar. Kevin writes, Hi, Adam. Uh, Sorry, me again. Behind on episodes, but I thought I'd respond to a couple emails about the music for uh, the Dollar episodes of this time period. I've not played on old-time radio, but I played the organ for many years, including Hammond, classical pipe organ, theater, pop organ, and piano, as well as many other keyboard instruments. I I know all these sounds very well. The question of the organ being Hammond or pipe organ is both answers are correct, but this is an unusual case. In these dollar shows of Lund and some of the later O'Brien shows, as well as the lineup where the orchestra was not used, Eddie Dunstetter, played the theater pipe organ for the opening, mid-show break, and ending music, but used other instruments for the background music. A Hammond with Leslie Speaker, a piano, and a Hammond Noble chord. He probably had these three instruments positioned together in a way so that he could reach to the sides of the Hammond organ and play either of the other instruments. The Novo chord was used here for solo instrumental uh, melodic passages accompanied by the organ or piano. It was not unique for a musician to use multiple keyboard instruments for radio accompaniment in this way. However, so far I've never uh, heard other examples where the theater pipe organ was also used for portions of the same program. I've always wondered why he did it that way, as the theater organ would have had much more tonal resonances for the variety of uh, drama accompaniment needed. But still, they are used well, played well, and effective. I'm quite sure that the music was not pre-recorded during this time, so you can see that Dunstetter was very busy with all the instruments he was playing. Dunstetter also used the three-instrument technique for Let George Do It, but without a theater organ. Uh, Richard Arant also used this technique for many of the shows he played for, if he wasn't also directing an orchestra, etc. Uh, Jeff Regan. Uh, organ and piano were often used together by a single player, both for radio and for live performances, but it was less frequent to hear one using three instruments and certainly very unusual to add the pop organ into the mix. There was at least one show where I heard Dunstetter transition from the Hammond and the piano directly to the pop organ without any break whatsoever. Anyway, for what it's worth, that's the info I can give you. I wish I'd been able to play for radio dramas as I would have enjoyed it. Uh, thanks again for all you do and for all you bring us. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. And I appreciate your uh, insight, which is quite helpful to someone who has no aptitude for musical instruments. I think to this day when people score an audio drama, they use a lot of different 
uh, instruments in doing so. Or try to find some ways to synthesize them. The folks at the British audio drama production company Big Finish talk a lot about what they do and how they do it. And they'll bring out like these really obscure instruments that I've never heard of and say, oh yeah, this musical instrument is what I needed. So I just go ahead and I throw in three or four notes of this. And I think that type of mindset certainly was something that Eddie Dunstetter had all those years ago. He was just an incredibly gifted musician. He could con pose music, and he could lead an orchestra. If there wasn't an orchestra present, he could play an organ and, like you said, combine a bunch of instruments in order to create just the right sound. I really do think I should check out some of his Christmas organ music this season. I've read some good things about it. There are a few musicians that you just don't hear about that you really gain an appreciation for if you listen uh, to enough old-time radio. Uh, certainly Paul Whiteman and Meredith Wilson. I'm so glad that the music man is still remembered and beloved uh, by so many people because that's something that he is uh, remembered for. But it's far from being the extent of his talent. I'm probably the only person who had not seen The Music Man, but was drawn to the idea of watching it after hearing all the amazing things he'd done in old-time radio. Now, of course, uh, you mentioned that, uh, that the pipe organ was not used on other programs where he did the combination, such as Let George Do It, but... Except for CBS, I don't think any of the other networks had access to a proper pop organ, at least not that I've read. That was one of the big advantages of Columbia Square. We have this question from Spencer who writes, Do you think people who listened to radio as it happened realized how many scripts were recycled? Uh, for example, the product called Daughter, at least two different Johnny Dollars and Jeff Regan uh, went to New Orleans to find her. But how many years apart were those episodes? Well, good question. There was actually a pretty big gap. Nearly uh, eight years, actually, in the case of that story between the prodigal daughter for Jeff Regan and the Pearling matter for Johnny Dollar. As for the broader question of whether I think people who listened to old-time radio at the time almost certainly did not notice that there was a script reuse. And I think, you know, there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, the people who listened to old-time radio had one shot to hear most of these programs. And then they were gone uh, forever, as far as they knew. And they also had less time to listen. So you have limited odds in the first place of them hearing both the first story and the recycled story. And because, you know, it wasn't like you would hear the episode of Richard Diamond and then a month later be on Johnny Dollar, be several months later. So the odds of most folks remembering a radio program they'd heard from several months uh, ago sounded something like the one they're listening to now wouldn't uh, really be a thing for most listeners. And you have to recall that there are a lot of plots that are quite similar. There are some standard ideas that get used in mystery programs quite a bit. A beautiful woman being chased by a mysterious stranger. A racketeer wanting a boxer to throw the big fight. A photographer hounded or murdered because of a photo they took of someone random in the background that a crook is determined must be destroyed, even though in reality it would be placed in the back of a photo album and not looked at for another 12 years. So we get a lot of similar stories in old time radio. And so a listener might think a story sounds familiar, like something in the back of their head says, I've heard a story like this before. But most likely, they're just going to think, yeah, there was a story I heard that was locked. Now, I, I'm certain that there was like one odd 
radio listener out there who listened to all the detective programs and kept a copious notebook and was able to cross-reference in his record-keeping potential script reuses, a photographic memory. But if this person existed, he did not leave any evidence behind such that we can discern. I think it very unlikely your, your average radio listener would have any notion about the amount of script reuses as opposed to just, this sounds similar to some other stories that have been played, with obvious exceptions, or if there was a fairly quick script reuse. For example, in the 1952 Johnny Dollar summer uh, series, in a 13-week stretch, they did the Mont video matter twice. That sort of thing the listener's going to notice. But Johnny Dollar reusing a Jeff Regan script, yeah, that would pr pretty much go over almost everyone's head. And then we have a comment from Carrie, this one uh, coming via email regarding uh, the Knot is a Weapon, uh, episode 3914S. Nightbeat is one of my all time favorite shows that you played on the great detectives of old time radio. I have to say, I saw the twist at the end coming from a mile away, pun intended. Well, thanks so much for the comment, Carrie. I really appreciate it. And I have to say that even though I have no reason to expect this will happen, I would really love it if we saw more Nightbeat come into circulation. Such a great series. Again, thanks so much for the comment, Carrie. Now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Candace, Patreon supporter since October 2021, currently supporting the program at the detective sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Candace. And that will actually do it for today. If you're not subscribed to the podcast, I encourage you to do so using your favorite podcast software, including Overcast, Spotify, Good Pods, or the Amazon Music app at amazon.com slash otrdetectives. If you are enjoying this podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. We'll be back next Friday with another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But join us back here tomorrow for Tales of the Texas Rangers, where... Clay. Yeah. It's a truck, all right. Coming pretty fast. Yeah, just flipped off their lights. Must be them. They don't stop. Try and get their tires. They're not going to stop. Give it to them. Come on, let's get after them. Yeah. Could have sworn we hit a back tire. Might have, but they got dual wheels on the rear. It's going to be tough working up any speed with the horse trailer on oh, the back. Give her all she's got. I'll get on the radio. Unit 10 to KTXA. KTXA to Unit 10. Go ahead, Unit 10. Subjects fail to halt at roadblock. They're proceeding north on Farm Road 48. Unit 10 pursuing. We'll notify all units. 10-4, Unit 10, clear. KTXA, Austin. I think we're gaining some, Jace. Sounds like they think so, too. Now, let me get that rifle. Jace, you all right? Yeah, I guess so. Two scratches from the glass. Sure made a mess of the windshield with that one. Hope their aim doesn't get any better. Now, I'll see if I can spoil it. Hey, you did it! You got that other back tire, Jace. They're going over. Hold it, Clay. There they go, climbing out of the cab. Watch yourself. Yeah, they're splitting up, Jace. Take the one across the road. I'll get the driver. Hey! I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash greatdetectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.